Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, again, as we always say, please, uh, if you could silence your cell phones so we can avoid any interruptions. Uh, my name is Muhammad Muhammad. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, on behalf of everybody here, our board of directors, our staff, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here, as well as everybody that's here online. Uh, it's also an honor to introduce and welcome back our uh, distinguished speaker, Dr. Osama Khalil, who will be speaking about his latest book, which is called America's Dream Palace, Middle East Expertise and the Rise of the National Security State. In T.E. Uh, Lawrence's classic memoir, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, Lawrence of Arabia claimed that he inspired a dream palace of Arab nationalism. What he really inspired, however, was an American idea of the area now called the Middle East that has shaped U.S. interventions over the course of a century with sometimes tragic consequences. America's dream palace brings into sharp focus the ways U.S. foreign policy has shaped the emergence of expertise concerning this crucial, often turbulent, and mi misunderstood part of the world. America's growing stature as a global power created a need for expert knowledge about the different regions. When it came to the Middle East, the U.S. government was initially content to rely on Christian missionar missionaries and Orientalist scholars. After World War II, however, as Washington's national security establishment required uh, professional expertise in Middle Eastern affairs, it began to cultivate a mutually beneficial relationship with academic institutions. Newly created programs at Harvard, Princeton, and other universities became integral to Washington's policymaking in the region. The National Defense Education Act of 1958, which aligned America's educational goals with Cold War security concerns, proved a boon for Middle, East, uh, Middle Eastern studies. But charges of anti-Americanism within the academy soon strained this cozy relationship. Uh, federal funding for areas uh, for area studies declined, while independent think tanks with ties to the government flourished. By the time the Bush administration declared its global war on terror, uh, Dr. Khalil writes, uh, think tanks that actively pursued agendas aligned with neoconservative goals were the drivers of America's foreign policy. Uh, copies of the book will be available for purchase after the event, so please... Uh, Please get one after uh, after Dr. Khalil finishes his talk. Um, and just a little bit about uh, Dr. Khalil. He's uh, an associate professor of history at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. He is serving as the interim director of Syracuse's Middle Eastern Studies program. Uh, he's also the author of America's Dream Palace, uh, which was named by uh, Foreign Affairs as the best book of 2017. He is the co-founder and board member of El Shabaka, uh, the Palestinian Policy Network. He has been a frequent media commentator and contributor, including for the Huffington Post, Los Angeles Times, The Hill, Al Akhbar, The National, and Al Jazeera. Uh, Dr. Khalil will speak for 30, for 30 to 40 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Again, as always, please wait for the mic to come to you if you have a question so that everybody online can hear as well. Uh, and for the online audience, uh, you can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Uh, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Osama Khalil. Thank you. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank Dr. Subhi and Dr. Eid and all the members of the Palestine Center's board not only for the invitation to speak here today, but for all the great work that they do. Uh, I also want to thank Muhammad again and uh, Samara for their help in coordinating the talk. Uh, so let me just say that the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center are essential institutions for Palestinians here in the United States, in Palestine, and around the world, and it's a tremendous honor to be here today. So as Muhammad mentioned, uh, he gave you the blurb about my book, America's Dream Palace, and this relationship to T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia. Uh, and this idea that he, as he claims in his memoir, that he inspired this, what he called the dream palace of Arab nationalism. But as I talk about in the book, and uh, this dream palace, what he actually inspired was this idea, right? And attempts by American scholars and policymakers and national security experts to shape the area that we now call the Middle East in America's image. Palestine was 
and remains at the center of these efforts. And the dream palace of today's talk, and the title of today's talk, refers to the efforts of Americans to bring peace to the Holy Land, that phrase you often hear in the media, uh, oftentimes by policymakers. And this was not just about bringing peace to the Holy Land, but their attempt to reconcile Washington's commitments to and its special relationship with Israel and its proclaimed goal of security and stability in the Middle East. Now, for seven decades, the Palestinians, especially Palestinian refugees, and the issue of Palestinian self-determination have been a consistent challenge to achieving the goal of regional security and stability. The U.S. managed peace process excluded the Palestinians for over two decades, from roughly 1948 to 1968. And what Washington decided to do was treat the Palestinians as a humanitarian issue rather than a political issue. The United States then attempted to ignore or undermine the Palestinians, especially the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, for about the next 25 years. But since 1993 and the Oslo Accords, the United States has co-opted the PLO with the willful support of the Fatah movement, and in particular, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat and his successor, Mahmoud Abbas. So here we are almost 25 years after the initial Oslo Accords were signed, and peace and a Palestinian state have not been achieved. So as Muhammad mentioned, the book covers a century of American involvement in the Middle East and the attempt to develop expertise about the region from World War I to the global war on terror and how America's interests in the Middle East were uh, basically shaped Middle East expertise. So today's talk is going to focus on the latter part of the book in which I examine the essential role played by think tanks and their close alignment with U.S. government agencies and interests in the Middle East and globally. So initially, these efforts focused largely on the adversary peace process. Some of this has been lost over time, has been forgotten about. So hopefully some of this will be a refresher for some of you or remind you. And in the ensuing four decades, the prevalence and influence of think tanks has grown dramatically. And as I discuss in the book, this reflected a growing rift between the government and academia during the Vietnam War. So during the Vietnam War period, a new generation of scholars emerged at leading universities that were increasingly reluctant to cooperate with U.S. government agencies or conduct research that was viewed as supporting U.S. foreign policy, and this included America's growing relationship with Israel. Well-funded think tanks that actively embraced the U.S. foreign policy and national security establishments filled this breach and offered the seemingly impartial expertise that Washington desired. So in today's talk, I'll focus on three think tanks and their involvement and influence on the average Israeli peace process, the Brookings Institution, the American Enterprise Institute, and the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And at the end of the talk, I'll discuss where we are today, and uh, both with think tanks and the peace process. And I'm happy to discuss other aspects of the book for those of you that are familiar with the arguments and the evidence in the Q&A. Speaking at the 50th anniversary celebration of the Brookings Institution in July 1966, President Lyndon Johnson declared, if you did not exist, we would have to ask someone to create you. Johnson's remarks focused on the domestic impact of the Brookings Institution's research and analysis. But less than a decade later, in 1975, Brookings would make a major foray into the foreign policy arena with its report toward peace in the Middle East. Now, the Brookings report sought to build on the disengagement agreements in the Sinai Peninsula between Israel and Egypt after the October 73 war. And it would inform efforts by the Carter administration to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict and contribute to the 1979 Camp David Accords. However, it also had the unintended consequence of inspiring the actions of a fledgling think tank in the mid-1980s, this time not to promote the peace process, but to slow it down, if not hinder it altogether. So the term think tank was used by the U.S. military during World War II to refer to a secure room or location where strategy and plans could be discussed. And it was first applied to the Rand Corporation in the 1950s. Originally a subsidiary of Douglas Aircraft, RAND was spun off into an autonomous unit after the war and initially relied on the U.S. government for funding and its research was focused largely on the military. Now, over time, RAND's funding and research diversified and expanded, and it became a model, if not the model, for think tanks to emulate. If you look around at think tanks today, you can see a lot of similarities to what RAND was doing initially and, and since. So as the number of think tanks expanded in the late Cold War era, so did their influence on policy. However, the external experts were never as completely impartial, were never completely impartial, as future contracts remained an ongoing concern. In addition, think tank staffers were recruited to serve in different administrations, and 
members of the foreign policy and national security establishment went on to serve in think tanks. So there's a revolving door that I discuss in the book between think tanks and the government that essentially, essentially replicates this revolving door that existed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s between academia and the government. So, although RAND is not a focus of this talk, they do play a role in the peace process after the outbreak of the Second Intifada, which I can discuss in the Q&A. Like RAND, the Brookings Institution is another established and prestigious think tank. Founded in 1916 as the Institute for Government Research, funding was initially provided by several prominent individuals, including John D. Rockefeller, banker J.P. Morgan, and businessman Robert S. Brookings, who the Institute was renamed after in 1927. Now, Brookings has generally been regarded as a moderate or even a liberal think tank, liberal in the kind of U.S. phrasing of it. But its policy positions have been uh, historically more nuanced. For example, it initially supported and then opposed the New Deal. It also assisted with the formation of the UN and the development of the Marshall Plan to rebuild Western Europe. But unlike Rand, Brookings did not initially conduct contract research, research nor was the government a major source of revenue. Now, during the Cold War, at least the early Cold War, Brookings' foreign policy analysis largely focused on the, 70, on the Soviet Union. But in 1975, it expanded to the Middle East and the Arab Israeli peace process. So this new focus for Brookings grew out of the Trilateral Commission. How many here remember or have heard of the Trilateral Commission? Okay. So it's interesting. The Trilateral Commission has kind of been lost to history, so I can see a smattering of hands. But it was formed in 1972 by David Rockefeller, who was then chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and Henry Owen of Brookings. Brookings was, uh, and the Trilateral Commission was an attempt by business, academic, and political elites to strengthen these ties between the United States, Europe, and Japan. But the Trilateral Commission was also critical of the detente policies pursued by Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. And a key figure was Columbia University's Big New Brzezinski, who recently passed away. So Brzezinski was not just a co-founder, but also a critic of detente and serves as the Commission's first director. Now, the Commission sponsored a number of meetings, as some of you will remember, and reports related to the world economy. But it was also concerned with what it termed the shared security challenges that the United States, Europe, and Japan had related to the Middle East. And one attendee at, a tri at trilateral Commission meetings was Georgia Governor and Democratic Party uh, candidate, or pre Democratic presidential candidate, rather, Jimmy Carter. In his memoirs, Brzezinski recalled that Carter attended a Commission meeting held in Japan and spoke forcefully and clearly on behalf of a fair Middle East settlement as very much in the U.S. national interest. And this will inspire the 1975 Brookings Report. So Henry Owen, who was Director of Foreign Policy at Brookings and a Trilateral Commission co-founder, as I mentioned, will lead this effort. And it's going to recruit a number of prominent academics. So this is going to be kind of the model that Brookings will establish that will then be, attempt to be copied with several major changes, as I'll talk about. So the academics that were recruited for the study included Brzezinski out of Columbia, William Quant, who was a former NSC staffer and then was a Brookings Fellow, UCLA's Malcolm Kerr and Steven Spiegel, and Harvard's Nadav Safran. So these were all kind of leading figures in Middle East studies in the, in the 1970s. Now, according to William Quant, one of the main drivers behind the Brookings study was the belief that the high-profile shuttle diplomacy adopted by Secretary of State Kissinger after the October War and that emphasized, or rather his emphasis, on interim agreements between the parties had exhausted itself. So what did Quant mean by this? And here I think it's important to take a step back and examine the regional and international conditions that led to the Brookings study. So when Richard Nixon entered office in January 69, the United States was in the midst of a losing war in Vietnam. And only 18 months earlier, Israel had uh, defeated Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, occupying the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, Sinai, and Golan. Now, in his first term, Nixon and Henry Kissinger, so it's important to remember, in the first term, Henry Kissinger was National Security Advisor, not Secretary of State, which we'll come back to. But Nixon and Henry Kissinger focused on ending the Vietnam War, first militarily, and when that failed, diplomatically. Nixon and Kissinger did not consider the Arab Israeli conflict a priority. And based on the available evidence that we have as historians, as scholars, they actively sought, with the assistance of Israel, to scuttle plans by Nixon's first Secretary of State, William Rogers. So what was Rogers trying to do? So William Rogers is a, is a friend of Nixon's. He has a very limited portfolio at state. Much of this is being consolidated in the White House by Nixon and Kissinger. And Rogers decides to try and solve the Arab Israeli conflict using UN, resolution, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 242, which had what was called the Land for Peace Framework. So for those in the room who know, 
Uh, the resolution called for Israel to withdraw from the territories it occupied in the June war in exchange for peace with its neighbors. Rogers is going to target two states, Egypt and Jordan. But he'll be undermined by the White House and by Israel. Now, by mid-1973, as Nixon has been re-elected, and with America's involvement in Vietnam over, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat had grown frustrated by being ignored by the United States and Israel. And with Syrian President Hafez al-Assad, he sought to shake the status quo with the October 73 war. So as many will remember, Egypt and, and Syria have initial gains that are then decisively countered by the Israelis and a ceasefire is declared. And here Kissinger recognizes two opportunities, not just by the conflict, but the ceasefires. First is to separate the Soviet Union from Egypt. Now he had this opportunity before, as many in the room know. Uh, Sadat and Egypt had made several entreaties to the United States, several signals, as well as to Israel that they were interested in negotiations and significant negotiations, which were ignored. The other, uh, the other opportunity that Kissinger recognizes is to separate Egypt from the combined neg Arab negotiating position. Right? So this unified Arab negotiating position which demanded a comprehensive settlement. And instead, what Kissinger wants to do is focus on bilateral agreements and negotiations rather than a comprehensive one. And this, of course, aligned with Israel's preferences as well. As well. And Kissinger's very public shuttle diplomacy was successful. So he achieves disengagement agreements in, between Egypt and Israel in Sinai and between Syria and Israel in the Golan. But Kissinger will spend the next year focusing on a very limited disengagement agreement in Sinai, what becomes known as Sinai II, at a very heavy political cost. There will be high tensions between the United States and Israel uh, in mid, mid to late 1975. And even though an agreement is signed, a Sinai II agreement is signed, the Ford, the Ford administration particularly Ford and Kissinger, will decide this is not working. So this is really what, what brings us back to Quant's statement about the uh, interim agreements and high-level diplomacy had exhausted itself. Now, when it was released, the 1975 Brookings Study Group report toward peace in the Middle East was deemed controversial. Yet four decades later, its main recommendations seem moderate, even unremarkable. But several aspects, and that's important as I'll, I'll talk about, were, were influential. The major recommendation of the report was that the United States should pursue comprehensive, a comprehensive settlement to the conflict. And it cautioned that the interim agreements negotiated by Kissinger had not addressed the underlying causes of the conflict. Now, these were not generally controversial. What was controversial was the recommendation for Palestinian self-determination. And Brookings argued this would be achieved as part of a larger agreement in which Israel was recognized and an independent Palestinian state would be created or, as an alternative, a Palestinian Jordanian confederation. Now, the report did not explicitly call for Washington to negotiate with or recognize the PLO. And two things to keep in mind. So this is 1975. And the year before, both the UN and the Arab League have recognized the PLO as the sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. The PLO has also attempted, over the previous two years, to establish relations with the United States that have not really advanced very far. Now, another factor is that as part of the Sinai II agreement, initialed at roughly the same time the Brookings Report is released, the United States has signed a secret memorandum with Israel in which it agreed not to recognize or negotiate with the PLO until it accepted UN Security Council Resolution 242 and its sister resolution 338. Now, the Brookings Report had several other aspects. So that's kind of the broader underlying piece to some of the, the negative reaction to the Brookings Report. Now, the report had several other aspects that would become recurring features of the peace process and subsequent proposals over the next three decades. This included phased implementation of the agreement and stage withdrawals by Israel to the June 67 border. So as you look back to 75, you can see some of the outlines of what will become the Oslo Agreement, as well as some of the pitfalls. Now, the Brookings report was shared with Carter and Cyrus Vance, a trilateral commission member who became Secretary of State. So even though, as I'll talk about, there's a lot of focus on the Brookings plan and the Brookings report, the trilateral commission arguably has more influence on Carter and on his administration. A number of members of the administration, including Carter, uh, including Vance, Brzezinski, will become members of the administration. Uh, William Quant will return to the NSC. And although Carter and Vance read the report, Quant later wrote that it would be an exaggeration to say that the report served as a blueprint for the policies of the Carter administration. Now, even though it may not have been a blueprint, toward peace in the Middle East appeared to set the parameters uh, for the Carter administration's attempts to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. 
Shortly after taking office, the Carter administration identified the Middle East as an urgent priority and pursued a comprehensive resolution to the conflict, including outreach to the PLO. Carter also made public statements about the need for a solution to the Palestinian problem, including his use of the term Palestinian homeland. Now, this led to an immediate backlash from members of Congress and skepticism in the press. Now, the administration's plan brought renewed attention to Brookings and the Brookings Report. And in particular, in Israel, the initiative and the Brookings Report were linked to and criticized for their similarity to the William Rogers Plan, Nixon's first Secretary of State. So the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv will report back to Washington that Carter's proposal and the Brookings report, Carter's proposal was seen as lying, the origins of it were seen as lying in the Rogers Plan and the Brookings Report. The first of which, the Rogers Plan, is viewed here in Israel, is totally rejected here in Israel. And the latter, the Brookings Report, is regarded with grave suspicion. So it's important to remember, what did the Rogers Plan call for? Land for peace based on UN Security Council Resolution 242. And that is totally rejected in Israel in 75, 76. These criticisms were repeated by leaders of the American Jewish community. For example, Rabbi Arthur Herzberg of the American Jewish Congress, who's a former colleague of Brzezinski's at Columbia, criticized the Brookings Report in interviews, as well as in meetings with the Carter administration. Now, several Arab states, in contrast, expressed interest not just in the report, but were actually, as the Tunisian Foreign Ministry says, impressed by it because it reflected some of their own proposals to ending the Arab Israeli conflict. Now, Carter is going to face, as many in the room know, a number of challenges, including Sadat's reluctance to accept full normalization with Israel, the PLO's rejection of UN Security Council Resolution 242, and then the main one will come with the May 1977 uh, Israeli election in which the Likud party comes to power and Menachem Begin becomes prime minister. So, although Begin eventually signed the Camp David Accords with Egypt, a broader agreement was unfulfilled and Begin was unwilling to embark on a comprehensive discussion and was unwilling to negotiate with the PLO. Now, a limited, provision, a limited autonomy provision was included in the Camp David Accords, as many know, but was never implemented. Nor did subsequent administrations follow Carter's example. Yet, as we demonstrated, other think tanks sought to replicate the perceived influence of the Brookings Institution. Now, one of the earliest think tanks to copy Brookings was the conservative American Enterprise Institute, AEI. Now, shortly after Ford's defeat in the 76 election, his Secretary of the Treasury, William Simon, explained to the Washington Post that AEI could play a key role for the Republican Party in the 1980 election, only three years away. And Simon told the Washington Post, while the Democratic Party, quote, had Brookings, Republicans ought to use AEI, and we will over the next four years. And President Ford joined AEI after leaving office and was joined by other members of his administration, and this included the new head of AEI, William Baruti Jr. Baruti's father had served as the previous director. Now, although AEI emerged as a conservative competitor to the Brookings Institution, its policy analysis related to the Middle East initially reflected the bipartisan support for the Arab Israeli peace process and the Camp David Accords. So one of the major figures responsible for this was Harold Saunders. And Harold Saunders was a former Assistant Secretary of State for Near East and South Asian Affairs. He joins AEI as a research fellow. But when he was at State, Saunders worked with Kissinger on the disengagement agreements. He worked on the Camp David Accords. And he also contracted AEI and Brookings to develop assessments on the Palestinian issue. And after the Camp David Accords were signed, Saunders is going to contract with AEI to develop a proposal for autonomy elections in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So this may be surprising to some in the room, but the AEI of the late 70s, early 80s is not the AEI of today, right? as will become apparent in a bit. At AEI, Saunders was joined by Judith Kipper, another research fellow, and into the 1980s, during Reagan's first term, Saunders and Kipper advocated for a resolution to the, of the Palestinian issue, including contact with the PLO. Now, as you can imagine, a change is coming. So after Ronald Reagan's sweeping 1980 victory over Carter, staffers from conservative think tanks were welcomed into the new administration. And within a few years, Brookings was competing with AEI and the Heritage Foundation for attention in the press and policymakers. Now, although the conservative think tanks attempted to copy Brookings, the Reagan administration did not attempt to copy Carter. Nor to, and they did not want extensive involvement in the Arab Israeli peace process. In addition, key members of Carter's foreign policy and national security staff remained outside of government. This included Brzezinski, Quant, and Saunders. Instead, U.S. foreign policy toward the Arab Israeli conflict during the Reagan administration 
and arguably since, was dominated by conservative and neoconservative elements with close ties to Israel. Indeed, under Reagan, strategic cooperation between the United States and Israel was expanded. This included greater military and intelligence coordination and collaboration, and this will be a trend as I'll talk about. This enhanced relationship between the United States and Israel was reflected in two think tanks, one established and one new, that both, emerged, that both basically come, uh, come to this point during Reagan's second term. And it was during Reagan's second term, really by 85, 86, that AEI moved further to the right. And one of the key figures responsible for this shift was Irving Kristol. Now, for those who don't know, Irving Kristol, during the 1950s, served as executive director of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. How many of you have ever heard of the Congress for Cultural Freedom? Okay. All right, so this is another one of these, right? Uh, okay. So that's fine. So the Congress for Cultural Freedom, as I talk about in the book and many others have written about, was an organization that received funding from the CIA with the goal of influencing intellectuals and artists to join the fight against communism. All right. So they're kind of targeting left and progressive intellectuals and artists, but anti-communist uh, intellectuals and artists. So one of the things they're going to do is they're going to fund a number of journals, a number of exhibits, and one of those journals will be a journal called Encounter. There's another one that's an Arabic language journal called Hiwar that I talk about in the book. Uh, and Encounter, of course, is co-edited by Irving Kristol. But by the mid-60s, the CIA funding is exposed and the CCF shuts down. A number of these journals shut down, if not all of them. Krista will later go on to join commentary. And in the late 70s, early 80s, he becomes affiliated with AEI and then leads and starts to recruit other neoconservatives to the think tank. So in the same way that Krista recruits neoconservatives to AEI, he recruits neoconservatives from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party in their support of Reagan in the 80 and 84 elections. So as I discuss in the book, like the Trilateral Commission, new conservatives were also opposed to the Nixon-Ford-Kissinger uh, detente policy. And a number of neoconservatives were campus radicals during the 1960s and members of the New Left movement. But they split with the New Left, and effectively with the Left, over criticism of Israel. AEI's neoconservative shift was aided by, by the ouster of its director, William Broody Jr. And Broody was forced out, many will say, over fiscal mismanagement, which was, may have been true, but also for criticism of Israel at events sponsored by the Institute during his tenure. And after Broody left, research fellows Saunders and Kipper also left. And into the 1990s, the new neoconservative AEI became a sharp critic, sharp critic, if not opponent of the Oslo Accords, and promoter for regime change in Iraq. And as I discussed in the book, during the Clinton administration, AEI was an early advocate for reshaping the Middle East by invading Iraq and overthrowing Saddam Hussein. So the establishment and influence of the Washington Institute for, National, for Near East Policy was another example of this growing tie between the United States and Israel during the Reagan administration in the second term. Uh, so WINEP, as it becomes known, was founded in February of 1985 by the influential pro-Israel lobby, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, AIPAC. But this overlap between AIPAC and the Washington Institute was not superficial. Martin Indyk former deputy director for research at AIPAC, served as WINEP's first executive director. Other AIPAC officials were among WINEP's founders. Now, the organization grows rapidly, and it develops strong links with, the Washington, with Washington policy circles very quickly. And this is demonstrated in only two years. Secretary of State George Shultz speaks at a WINEP-sponsored conference. So this conference is in September 1988, in the midst of the first Palestinian Intifada. So as many here know, the first intifada corresponded with a period of unprecedented international criticism of Israel. Now, the PLO's leadership, which at this point was based in Tunis, is still attempting to establish relations with the United States, and it views the intifada as an opportunity to do this, as well as this criticism of Israel. But it's rebuffed by the Reagan administration. And in his speech to the Washington Institute, Schultz asserted that peace could not be achieved through the creation of a Palestinian state. But he offers hope. If the PLO renounced terrorism, recognized Israel, and accepted UN Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338, Washington would consider it for participation in the peace process. Now, as we all know, the PLO met those conditions two months later, and discussions with the Reagan administration and the Bush administration begin, but they don't lead to a breakthrough in either U.S. PLO relations or the peace process. So in effect, the, the PLO trades away some key negotiating cards in terms of recognition and gets nothing in return. Now, coinciding with Schultz's speech, the Washington Institute published a study 
based on its own study group. So here they're deliberately trying to copy the example of the Brookings 1975 study group with several major differences. Instead of focusing on academics, the Washington Institute targets former policymakers and elected officials uh, from both the George W. Bush campaign and the Mike Dukakis campaign, Governor Mike Dukakis of Massachusetts. Now, Martin and Dyke will explain that the Brookings plan was precisely what we were trying to replicate. And he added that key, the key was that the people engaged in the report went into the administration and had a common idea of what they wanted to do. Now, as I mentioned, there's going to be major differences in, in terms of who's involved in the Washington Institute study group as well as the recommendations. So who's involved? Under Secretary of State uh, for Political Affairs Lawrence Eagleburger and former Vice President Walter Mondale will be the co-chairs. The participants will include former and future Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, Harvard's Joseph Nye, conservative columnist Charles Krautheimer, and Daniel Pipes, the director of the Foreign Policy Institute. Now, the lineup of particip participants demonstrates a clear ideological agenda, one that was apparent then and is even more evident now. And this was reflected in the recommendations. So you're going to notice some familiar language. Remember, this is 1988. And this language has been adopted over the years by Israeli officials, including current Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. So the Washington Institute report is going to argue that the Middle East is a dangerous place, quote unquote, right, for the United States. And as many of you will notice, Benjamin Netanyahu makes this claim a lot, so will other Israeli officials, that the Middle East is a dangerous neighborhood, right? And more importantly, what will become a common refrain over the next several decades, the Washington Institute report will assert that the U.S. cannot make peace for these parties. It can only assist them once they are willing to do so. And here we see the influence of Dennis Ross. Right? So Dennis Ross is a key figure at the Washington Institute and then later in policy circles. And in earlier policy proposals, Ross will argue that the Reagan administration needed to revive the approach adopted by Kissinger before the October 1973 war. And that approach, of course, patiently awaiting real movement from the local parties. Yet Kissinger's approach was proven to be a failure, as demonstrated not just by the war, but a near nuclear showdown between the United States and the Soviet Union and the ensuing Arab oil embargo. But what was unsaid in this recommendation is that the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty had dramatically changed the regional landscape to Israel's benefit. And Israel had no reason to abandon that advantage. Now, there's another aspect here that's unsaid, right? So in Ross's language, this idea that we have, the United States has to patiently wait for the parties. You'll notice the emphasis on the plural. But really, there's only one party for the Washington suit that counts, and that's Israel. Right? And it's only when Israel is ready to make peace and on its terms should the United States become involved. Now, as I mentioned, the PLO was actively seeking recognition from Washington, but the Washington Institute did not recommend any kind of involvement with the PLO. Instead, it suggested that the new pal a new Palestinian leadership be drawn from the occupied territories. And and what, again, will be another influential aspect that's going to argue that transitional phases need to be adopted in any kind of agreement. Even before an agreement, there have to be what are called confidence-building measures. So those of you who are familiar with the language of the peace process and the language of the Oslo Accords, you can see this in 1988, this idea that confidence-building measures between Israelis and Palestinians, and it's really on the Palestinian side, as Winnep says, so that the intentions of Palestinians to live in peace with Israel and Jordan could be tested. All right? So these recommendations were accepted in part by the George Herbert Walker Bush and Clinton administrations, and the emphasis on confidence-building measures becomes a hallmark of the Oslo Accords and after. Right. So here we have a new fledgling think tank making its mark on U.S. Middle East policy or attempting to make its mark on U.S. Middle East policy by copying the Brookings, Brookings administration. So how is Brookings going to respond? Right? Brookings is the more established uh, institute. It has much bigger name recognition. And, of course, it's going to launch its own competing study in preparation for the 88 election. So this will be coordinated by William Quant. And, as you can imagine, it's going to have very different recommendations right, and a, and a contrasting approach with the Washington Institute. So let's see who wins. I don't want to give away the ending. Right. Uh, so Quant, now if you remember, the Washington Institute says the United States should wait patiently for the end. Quant says no. Continued stalemate, and the Brookings Report says continued stalemate, threatens U.S. national interests. And the Brookings Study Group is going to argue 
that the next administration should provide a steady, high-level commitment to the peace process, including involving the Soviet Union if they'll play a constructive role. So you can see a very different approach. One says, wait. One says, you need to get involved. Now, the Brookings Report is also going to base their strategy again on U.S. Security Council Resolution 242. The PLO has now accepted it. All right? Now, unlike WINEP, the Brookings Report will recommend that the Palestinians should select their own representatives, not the United States or Israel. And it concedes that these representatives may either have to be explicitly or implicitly endorsed by the PLO. But one thing they will share, and again you will see this over and over again, is this idea of transitional steps. Right? So Brookings and WINEP share that idea, and that will be carried forward. Now, just like its predecessor in 1975, the 1988 Brookings Report will encounter resistance from leading figures in the American Jewish community. And again, they will liken it to the 75 report and the Carter administration. And what they will, what they will say internally uh, is that they fear it's going to inspire, quote, American assertiveness, and that this will lead to a negative reaction from Israel. But they need not have worried, because unlike its predecessor, the 1988 Brookings Report was ignored. Instead, WINEP's recommendations and staff would predominate in Washington. Some of them would become key figures in the George Herbert Walker administration, George Herbert Walker Bush administration, including Eagleburger, who's promoted to Deputy Secretary of State. Richard Haas was named the NSC's Senior Director for Near East and South Asian Affairs. Dennis Ross was selected to head the State Department's policy planning staff. Some other names you might know, Francis Fukuyama, who serves with Haas on the NSC, and Ross's aide, Aaron David Miller. Now, with the end of the, goal, of the Cold War, and the aftermath of the first Persian Gulf War, as many in the room know, President Bush and Secretary of State James Baker launched a diplomatic initiative to resolve the Arab-Israeli conflict. And they again encountered resistance, this time from Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir. Now, hanging over their proposed peace conference, the Baker-Bush peace conference, was the question of whether the Palestinians would participate and what role, if any, would the PLO have. And that, of course, was eventually resolved with the creation of a joint Palestinian-Jordanian negotiating team which did not contain PLO members from outside the occupied territories. But the subsequent peace conference and direct negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians didn't really resolve anything. Although they met and that inspired optimism, the negotiations quickly bogged down over any matters of substance rather than just matters of process and photo ops. And a year later, we have another presidential campaign and another Washington Institute study. And this one, again, will be comprised of members from the political campaign. So again, academics are now excluded. This is ex exclusively in the realm of policymakers and politicians. Now, the report argued that the end of the Cold War, it's called Pursuing Peace, uh, argued that the end of the Cold War and the Gulf War had, quote, broken the back of the rejectionists and discredited the PLO because of Arafat's public support for Saddam Hussein. But it offered hope. With a new Israeli government led by Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, who appeared to be committed to negotiations and a changed regional and international landscape, there was the possibility for a final resolution. But, and this should probably surprise uh, nobody in the room at this point, the Washington Institute report did not recommend that the next administration pursue a comprehensive solution. So even though the regional landscape has changed and the international landscape has changed, there's no reason to adopt a comprehensive solution. Instead, Washington should again focus on achieving interim solutions between Israel and the Arab states. Again, you'll notice Israel and the Arab states. The Palestinians are to be left on the side. And what it will say is, echoing Israel's position, that the United States should advocate for Palestinian self-government rather than a Palestinian state. Now keep in mind, this is still in the middle of the first intifada, which is flagging by 1992, but it's still going on. And the Washington Institute argues that Israel's occupation was, quote, unwanted and unwelcome, but the caveats to ending it in the report and afterward re uh, repeatedly undermine negotiations over the next two decades. And again, in a common refrain that is repeated almost until today, if not today, the report maintained that the United States should not be any more anxious to reach an agreement than the parties themselves. Now, when George, w, George Herbert Walker Bush lost the 1992 presidential election, it appeared that Bill Clinton would select a new Middle East team. And some thought he would go back to uh, members of the Carter administration and those involved at Camp David. However, Clinton surprisingly appointed a holdover from the Bush administration, Dennis Ross. And of course, the breakthrough did not come through the efforts of Ross or the United States, but as many 
in the room know it came through Norway, and the 1993 Declaration of Principles. Right. Now, key aspect of the Declaration of Principles, as many know, was limited self-rule in the West Bank, uh, in the West Bank city of Jericho, and parts of the Gaza Strip. And after the breakthrough was announced, the Clinton administration, and in particular President Bill Clinton, became heavily involved in subsequent negotiations. Now, these negotiations were only supposed to last five years, but they're extended to seven. And, of course, they're undermined in part by the 1995 assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and Benjamin Netanyahu's emergence as leader of the Likud party. But one key aspect that, that has kind of been overlooked in this is that when the talks stall, as they inevitably do, especially once Netanyahu gets involved, the Clinton administration defers back to the Winnet position, which is that the parties had to want peace for negotiations to succeed. But remember, the Winnet position is based on one party, right? not two. This approach contrasted with the recommendations of those outside the Washington Institute and the administration who argued for a more active American role to break the deadlock, including William Quant and Richard Haas at Brookings, and that will change. Privately, the Clinton administration sided more closely with Israel. On November 1998, memorandum from Secretary of State Madeleine Albright to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu explained that the United States would, quote, conduct a thorough consultation process with Israel in advance with respect to any ideas the U.S. may offer to the parties for their consideration. Right. So the U.S. is going to discuss any proposals with Israel first and then present them to the Palestinians. Netanyahu will pocket this primus, and so will his successor, Ehud Barak. And Barak will use it two, uh, two years later at Camp David. Now, of course, as many in the room know, before the 2000 summit, Clinton convinced a reluctant Arafat to attend the talks, and he promised Arafat that he would not blame him if the talks failed. All right. After the summit failed, predictably, Clinton blamed Arafat, as did Dennis Ross, even though the negotiations continued into January 2001 with the election of Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. Now, with the collapse of the peace process and outbreak of the Second Palestinian Intifada in September 2000, the Washington Institute continued to expand its presence in media and policy circles. Martin Indyke joined the Brookings Institution after serving as U.S. Ambassador to Israel and Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs. And at Brookings, Indyke receives a call from media mogul Haim Saban, a wealthy donor to the Democratic Party. Now, Saban wanted to establish a think tank specifically focused on the Middle East and securing Israel's future. Now, Indyke says, well, why don't you just donate to WinUp? Basically, that's what it's there for. And Saban says, no, I prefer to, to form my own think tank. And so instead, he will make a $13 million donation to the Brookings Institution, and the Saban Center for Middle East Policy was established. Now, Saban later explained to the New York Times in 2004 his interest in politics and foreign policy. I'm a one-issue guy, he said, and my issue is Israel. Now, Saban was not alone. The attachment to Israel in protecting and promoting its relationship with America united Democrats and Republicans. It also paralleled a tightening of the special relationship between the United States and Israel in the post-Cold War era, building on the Reagan, Reagan years, as I talked about. Now, during the Clinton administration, it evolved into a strategic relationship, and after September 11, 2001, it was transformed into a strategic alliance. Now, at each stage, there is increasing military and intelligence collaboration and coordination, increased military aid, advanced weaponry, etc. Now, while the relationship with Israel was enhanced, the Bush administration disengaged from the peace process, this is the George W. Bush administration, and adopted a policy of conflict management rather than conflict resolution, which was in line with WINEP's recommendations. So to be clear on the difference, to be clear on the difference, while conflict resolution would theoretically bring an end to Israel's occupation, theoretically, conflict management enables it to continue. In addition, the management of conflict here is the focus on violence, not the entrenched and systemic violence of Israel's occupation and continued settlement policies, but an emphasis on reducing Palestinian violence against Israel. Now, Bush also relied on Israel, on Israel newly elected Prime Minister Ariel Sharon to suppress the Second Intifada, believing it would force the Palestinians to make the necessary condition, concessions rather, for a final peace deal. Arafat was sidelined by, by the Bush administration, who argued that a new Palestinian leadership, untainted by terror, was required to achieve peace. Now, with the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, the peace process was no longer a priority for Washington. As I discussed in the book, think tanks, especially AEI and Brookings, 
were deeply involved in establishing and justifying the rationale for invading Iraq. Of course, one justification, as some will remember, for, by proponents of the war, was that the road to peace in Jerusalem was through Baghdad. Now, here we are 15 years later, and that has been proven to be demonstrably false. Although high-profile diplomacy continued under George W. Bush and Barack Obama, invariably with support from established and new think tanks, there is little to show for these efforts on the ground. Indeed, Washington think tanks are largely, largely remain bound, if not beholden to, the two-state solution and attempts to revive the Oslo process with proposals that are divorced from the, from the reality of a half century of occupation and 70 years of dispossession. And those are the proposals that attempt to resolve the conflict, not those that seek to manage it. So where are we today? Over the past three years, there have been a number of revelations about and criticisms of the cozy relationship between leading think tanks and corporations, as well as with repressive Arab Gulf monarchies. This includes the tailoring of research toward donors and funders. Now, several Gulf states have not been content merely to make donations to think tanks or to fund research projects, but have established their own think tanks with the goal of representing their interests in Washington. Meanwhile, the Saban Center at Brookings has sponsored at least one private event aimed at undermining the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And at last year's Saban Forum, Saban hosted the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and publicly thanked him for his efforts in attempting to block a resolution, a very weak resolution, by the way, by the Obama administration in late 2016, criticizing Israel's settlements. Right? Now, this attempt by Kushner and then President-elect Trump may actually have been illegal. Right? and was definitely unprecedented, but he was thanked for it, which raises the issue as to why a leading think tank is sponsoring such efforts. Even more troubling have been the actions of the Trump administration, which has adopted the research and policy proposals of think tanks on the far right of the political spectrum, including some that no one ever would have listened to just a few years ago. And this is especially toward the Palestinians and the broader Middle East. And thus it appears that the dream palace I talked about at the beginning the attempt by American scholars, national security experts, and policymakers to construct and shape the Middle East over the past century will continue for the foreseeable future. Thank you for coming, and I look forward to your questions. Time for questions. Dr. Khalid, thank you very much for discussing your book. Uh, I have a question. I don't know if there's a quick answer to it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that most uh, American for foreign policy was driven by mostly by neoconservative uh, uh, think tanks, right. but is there a reason why it went that way rather than towards the neoliberal um, think tanks? So I, I wouldn't consider them neoliberal think tanks. Um, I think, uh, as, as I talk about in the book, and as I, as I mentioned here, um, there is a, uh, you know, one of the, when you think about neoconservatism, what, what it uh, entails, uh, one of the things it actually entails is, of course, neoliberal economic policy, right? Um, but also, as I mentioned, there's a focus on, and a divergence. So when we talk about the Vietnam War as this origin point and this divergence point, and that neoconservatives were opposed to the detente policy. One of the reasons why they're opposed to the detente policy of, of uh, Nixon, Ford, and Kissinger is this idea that you can't negotiate with evil. So you hear a lot of that over and over again, right? One of the reasons why they're opposed to the Trilateral Commission is they don't actually want kind of an equal relationship between the United States, Europe, and Japan. What they want is American primacy, right? So uh, in a way, what I think uh, should come across, and I think comes across in the book and here, is that uh, you know there's a culture of timidity in think tanks, right? Uh, and because of this revolving door, and it's not just in think tanks, but in government itself, because of this revolving door between think tanks um, and the government, you end up seeing that those same individuals becoming populated and repopulating themselves across other think tanks, right? So there's an institutional aspect of this as well as a personal aspect and, and uh, policy aspect. Uh, so because these individuals are actually trained in many of the same places, Right? and then they're trained within the government as well as the same think tanks, and then go out and populate other think tanks, you see these same kind of stale ideas being populated basically across Washington. There's also an idea that, look, these are successful organizations, and how did they become successful? Right? So you, al you almost always want to copy success. 
The other aspect I would, I would uh, bring up, and this is what I touched on at the end, is that it's not just that there's a culture of timidity, right, both within government and in the think tanks. Uh, it's also that the, the desire for access becomes really important. So you're not going to produce uh, policy proposals that will not get you access or that get you thrown out of the room. So again and again, you'll see these attempts, and, and some of them become increasingly ridiculous. So for instance, uh, during the Obama administration, uh, there's at least one think tank who will attempt to kind of revive the Oslo process, but they don't want to do a one-state solution proposal, so they, they come up with this idea that maybe everyone can be a permanent resident of either country. Um, how that actually is workable, and in fact, it's never workable, right? Because it ignores the actual reality on the ground, right? Uh, and it ignores the reality of actually the past 70 years, and, and in particular the past 50 years. So uh, I think part of it is there's a perceived success of certain think tanks, and that, thing, that success wants to be replicated, and the access definitely wants to be replicated. Okay. And I think there was a question about um, access. I've, I've actually talked to some think tanks before. Um, as you can imagine, they don't agree with this, um, but that's okay. Um, they're allowed to be wrong. So. They, let you, they, let you, they let you in the door, and they have, they have a conversation? There's a conversation. I don't know if they let me in the door, but there's a conversation. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do they come to the university? Occasionally, yeah. How many people like you? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I haven't read the book yet, so if it's in the book, just point me there. But I'm, I'm kind of interested in if, you're, if you've thought about it comparatively. You know, are, are there unique dynamics to this issue in the process, in the structures or the dynamics of think tanks and the relationship? Yeah. Or, you know, is this a generalizable kind of thing where you thought across different kinds of issues, whether it's like health care or other issues yeah. where there are maybe special interests heavily implicated and maybe, maybe laundering influence mm. through uh, these institutions? Well, yeah, I think, I think that's a great question, um, and, and thanks for that. Uh, the, look, there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that, the, you know, the Middle East, one of the, one of the arguments in the book is that the Middle East is, not, is not unique, right? Middle East studies is not unique in the broader trend mm. of academic expertise, right? The problem is that it's often been, as when uh, Muhammad gave the summary of the book, it's often, often been described that way, that Middle East studies is separate, is different, right, um, because of this anti-American, anti-Israel uh, thread that runs through. But uh, as we know, and as you, and this, this was an issue before the Trump administration, it's an issue now, um, there are attempts by the Tea Party and the far right wing of the Republican Party basically to defund uh, government funding towards higher education. And the Heritage Foundation actually was very open about this, that they wanted to target, and I talk about this in the book, that they wanted to target both Middle East and Latin American studies. So two studies that they want to target those for defunding as a way basically to get in the door and then target high, uh, funding to higher education uh, completely. As you also know, uh, members of the Tea Party wanted to target things like, and we've seen, you've all seen the proposals, um, and it's not just the Tea Party anymore, right? This is kind of a standard GOP approach now. NEH, uh, NEH funding, NSF funding, right? Anything that's not related to so the National Society, uh, National uh, Science Foundation, the National Education, uh, what is it, the National for the Humanities, um, that that also is going to be targeted. I actually think you know there, there are some aspects of this that are that are that can be applicable in other areas, right? So anytime you have an issue-driven topic, at the same time there is less of a tendency, particularly in foreign policy, to be creative in the thinking. The only time you, you really see creative thinking is how creatively can we bomb or, or intervene somewhere, right? That's when I think the think tanks really get, get worked up, is how, how they can do this creative approach with the, the various coalitions. But in terms of actual resolution to these conflicts, I, I don't think that uh, you're going to see a lot of creative uh, ideas coming out of the think tanks or out of the government agencies right now, now or, or really in the past decade. Um, in back in yeah. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Diane Perlman, uh, George Mason School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. So speaking of creative thinking about solutions, um, actually I'm co-teaching a course right now for the first time on think tanks at the School for Conflict Analysis right. and Resolution. But my interest is also to bring knowledge from the whole field of conflict studies into the think tanks and sort of um, objective social science, conflict dynamics, how do you right. reduce tension, how do you analyze the underlying conflict, what is it about, what are the parties one, identifying legitimate goals, right. you know, including like dignity, right. sovereignty. Right. 
So um, I'm assigning this lecture to my students, okay. and, uh, and I'll get your book. And Let me know how um, like okay. uh, no, this is really interesting because it's looking at it from the other side, and and I've been part of all of this. Yeah. Um, so a uh, question is. Um, I'm you know, very aware of the influence of APAC, but how does like J Street and Jewish Voice for Peace right. affect, um, does it make a dent? On, and also like Beinart's work on the youth um, being more, Jewish youth being more critical of Israel and all of that. That's a great question. And, and I think some of that's still playing out, right? Um, especially JVP. So for example, um, I mentioned at, at the end that there was a, a quote unquote private meeting held to target not just BDS, but the role of JVP, the increased role of JVP on campuses, right? Uh, and, and some of the participants, how we know about this meeting is because some of the participants talked about an open session about how concerned they were about JVP's increasing uh, membership and its increasing role on campuses. Uh, that has yet, and this is, so part of this is a generational issue, right? So that has, from, has yet to filter up, okay? Uh, I mean, in fact, if you, if you look at, um, you know, there, there was a lot of consternation when the Trump administration first came in from some of the major think tanks because for the first time they felt they were being locked out of the room, right? And they weren't getting the positions uh, within the administration that had, that had happened over the previous two decades. Uh, it just turns out that there were other think tanks that were being targeted or maybe lower level, lower level people. So I think there's still, uh, there's still a lot, we have still a long way to go. I think that the fact that JVP has a greater amount of presence on campus, and you're seeing a growing divestment uh, BDS movement uh, on campuses, is a sign of hope, right? Should these individuals end up going into think tanks, into the government, there may be a sign of hope. At the same time, there are really entrenched interests that are very difficult to overcome, and that includes it's not just about uh, whether it is uh, the pro-Israel lobby, but also, as I mentioned in, in the book and in, and, and in the talk today, uh, tends to overlook this really close emotional, ideological alignment between the United States and Israel that really you can trace back to the founding, if not before. Okay, so way back to 1948, if not before. And I think some of that is kind of overlooked when we focus just on uh, this idea of kind of an, an overarching and very powerful lobby, that it ignores how much of a alignment there is at several different levels. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, two things. One is the president's decision on Jerusalem, which didn't come out of nowhere, but it was preceded by the Russian uh, statement of July, Putin's statement on Jerusalem, uh, and was followed, uh, perhaps some unexpected consequences, uh, by uh, the Arab League position, uh, the European position, uh, and uh, the fact that Iran has now accepted the Arab initiative as a basis. Uh, secondly, there is the uh, fact that uh, the U.S., well, the Palestinians, uh, President Abbas has said that the U.S. is no longer a credible mediator, maybe never was, but, uh, and so looking to other countries to assume some kind of international leadership, perhaps including Russia, permanent member of the Security Council. Could you comment on the impact of these, these dynamics uh, on, uh, uh, on the situation? I mean, the Palestinians keep losing, but they, they lose the battles, but they're not really losing the war. Okay. Um, so, a couple of things, and I've actually written about this elsewhere. So for those of you who um, have written about this for Shebika uh, back after the, the Trump decision uh, in, a, in a piece uh, actually called Imposing Peace. So you can, I'll just repeat some of the arguments here. Uh, you're right that the, the decision on Jerusalem doesn't come out of nowhere, right? But it's really a culmination of 70 years of U.S. policy, right? It's not just this rapid break, right? This is 70 years of U.S. policy that is culminated in the Trump decision, right? Uh, and as I mentioned in the beginning, when you look at how the United States has dealt with the Palestinian issue, really dating back to 1948, 48, if not before, uh, and you can divide this up into two or three phases. So the first is ignoring the Palestinians, the second is then attempting to undermine them, and then the third is co-opting them. Right? So, and in particular by co-opting, co-opting the FETA movement. Um, 
so the, the Trump decision on Jerusalem is not shocking, and it's not as, uh, as much of a break as, as people would argue. Because for, as many in the room know, uh, for really since 67, the United States has turned a blind eye effectively, and, allowed, and many of its policies, including its tax policies, et cetera, uh, and, its, and its cover for Israel at the UN, uh, as well as its cover for Israel, as I talked about in, in the talk and in the book, its cover for Israel during the negotiations allowed this the expansive, expansive settlement and changing the actual shape of Jerusalem itself. So changing the actual demographics on the ground and the geography of Jerusalem on the ground. So it's really not that much of a break. Um, on the second piece about Abbas saying that there's no other, uh, that there's really, the U.S. is no longer an honest broker, I mean, this has been apparent for a long time. The problem for the, for the PLO is that they've put all their eggs, and Abbas has put all of his eggs in, on the U.S., right? Uh, Abbas and the Palestinians really don't have very many other options. And with the structure of the international system, uh, the reality is the U.S. will always be involved, right? So if you want to do this for the U.N., the U.S. is a member of the U.N. Security Council. It has a veto. You're not going to be able to get around a U.S. veto and U.S. support for Israel. Uh, so it creates a very difficult situation for the Palestinians, or at least for the Palestinian leadership and the PLO, because for really since 1988, they've embarked on this very elite-driven, negotiating-driven uh, policy and strategy that has now been, it was known to be a failure for some time, but now it's been fully exposed as a failure. Sure. But in a sense, hasn't the ball been moved forward? I mean, Russia in July, Putin in July said, mm -hmm that uh, we recognize East Jerusalem as the capital of the future Palestinian state. Right. And in that context, Putin said, we recognize West Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Right. Essentially, the international community has accepted this division of Jerusalem. So, again, it depends how you, it, well, well, it depends how you define the international community, right? Uh, there's another issue that you still have, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, which is the Israelis, right? Um, you know, it should be pretty apparent to everybody in the room, um, and particularly with Benjamin Netanyahu, and whoever replaces Netanyahu is not going to be replaced by Gandhi, right? <laughs> Let's be clear. Even if he goes to jail, he's not going to be replaced by Gandhi, right? Uh, and it is pretty clear that whoever takes his place is not going to go cut a deal, right? Netanyahu has made it clear since the 90s what his goal is. His policies, and it wasn't just him, but his policies have carried this through. So when we talk about the Dream Palace, and I talk about the Dream Palace, there is this idea, right, that somehow, maybe, Netanyahu will finally be able to be convinced to, to achieve peace, in the same way that perhaps Sharon would be able to be convinced to achieve peace. Um, it should be clear, I think, from the talk and from the documentary record uh, that there's one party here that has not wanted peace, and then one party that has continued to establish facts on the ground, over whether it's in Jerusalem or in the West Bank itself, that have made a two-state solution impossible, regardless of what the international community, quote-unquote, thinks. Uh, and so when we talk about the international community, it's important to remember that the United States is a key, if not the key, aspect of the international community. Um, so I, I'm not sure that I, I, I share your optimism that uh, the international community uh, is going to come forward because one of the things that you know we're forgetting here is the Arab Peace Initiative, which has been on the table for almost 15 years now, 16 years. Uh, Israel has never accepted the Arab Peace Initiative. In fact, it sought to undermine the Arab Peace Initiative. And instead, what we've seen is regional dynamics have changed in which, in its alignment with several Gulf monarchies, it's looking at Iran as the much bigger threat, and that's how they see it. And they are quite willing to abandon Jerusalem and the Palestinians uh, because of other interests. Hi. I Hi. was wondering how the history you laid out of policy analysis and these think tanks um, relates back to and reflects your mention of T.E. Lawrence and the American imaginary of the Middle East. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so one of the things I talk about and, uh, in the book is there is a whole generation or several generations of scholars who keep looking back to T.E. Lawrence as their example, right? So... They will grow up, they will read Seven Pillars of Wisdom, they will be assigned it in college or in, in, in high school, and there is a romantic idea of being the new T.E. Lawrence. And as I talk about in the book, this actually is taken beyond just this romantic idea to during World War II, uh, several 
Scholars will be recruited from leading universities, including Harvard, Princeton, et cetera. They will be sent to the Middle East as part of what's, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Office of Strategic Services, which was a forerunner of the CIA. And they'll be told, you're going to be the Lawrence of your generation. All right? um, now, it doesn't just end with World War II or the early Cold War. As I come back to uh, during the global war on terror, uh, as the invasion and occupation, as the occupation of Iraq rather is is failing because of an act of insurgency, counterinsurgent expert counterinsurgency experts in the United States start looking for examples, right? And so, who do they find? They decide that T. E. Lawrence is the counterinsurgency is a counterinsurgency example, right? Uh, that he's the counterinsurgency expert that Americans sh should emulate. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia, right? And as I talk about in the book, there's a very constructed view of Lawrence, and one would argue a false view of Lawrence that is presented by counterinsurgency experts that somehow make him into, right, this counterinsurgency expert. So um, the, the long short of it is I'd say read the book, right? Uh, Phil Schrafer, a retired international healthcare consultant, live up the street. Um, the uh, Saudis, yeah. uh, Prince SBM. Any relationship to these groups you're talking? We know he's working with Khalid Kushner, but <laughs> well, I mean, uh, as I mentioned at the end, uh, a number of the Gulf monarchies, including the, the Saudis, have established their own think tanks here. All right, uh, they have been making they've been making donations both to academic institutions uh, as well as the think tanks for some time. All right, not just the Saudis, but Qatar and the UAE. But uh, the Saudis have their own uh, their own think tank here now in the U.S. In fact, they just had a major uh, a major conference. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a conference, but they had a major event earlier this week, which included people like actually MBS's favorite uh, 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 mouthpiece, Tom Friedman from the New York Times, was uh, there. Um, for those of you who don't know, Tom Friedman did a did a, a really uh, interesting interview, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, with with Bin Salman and uh, with the Crown Prince and presented a very uh, favorable view of his policies. Um, uh, all the while, there is effectively uh, a terrible war being prosecuted in Yemen by the Saudis with U.S. support, right, with active U.S. support. So, um, you know, that uh, – now, he's tried to defend it. He's tried to defend that interview in typical uh, Friedman-esque fashion. Um, but, yeah, I think you can look to the Arabia Foundation. I think if you if – you, look at some of their analysis, particularly toward Iran. If you even look at some of their analysis toward the, um, uh, they won't call it a kidnapping and they won't call it detention, but they will just say the, uh, you know, uh, the brief visitation by the Lebanese prime minister. Um, <laughs> right. I think you can see how, how they view that. Um, and that'll give you an amazing insight into um, how they view Saudi Arabia's role in the world. Uh, going forward, uh, thinking about how things might turn out here, uh, how do the uh, groups think of one state as kind of a thing, kind of uh, one state, equal rights, um, how do they deal with that issue? That's essentially Iran's position mm -hmm. to a certain extent, uh, give everybody in the country, pal all the Palestinians, equal rights and an equal vote. Well, I, I think the pro part of the problem is, as, as I hinted at, is that they, or as I suggested at the end, is that they, they don't, they haven't really addressed it, right? Um, because it's it's seen. So what's what's interesting is when you talk to, um, and in fact, this isn't even off the record anymore, right? So so John Kerry, as Secretary of State, was heavily criticized uh, when he suggested that if Israel does not make a, a, a peace deal, that we're really looking at apartheid. Um, and he's not the first to say it, and he won't be the last. And, and the reality is this is the apartheid word is thrown around a lot, right? And it's not just by disgruntled secretaries of state or as a warning, right? Ehud Barak has used it. Omert used it. Uh, so you have several former Israeli prime ministers who, who see this. Um, and But at the same time, because it is not seen, uh, because there is such resistance to this idea, all right, uh, within Washington policy circles as well as within um, elite circles in Israel. Uh, 
uh, the think tanks are either unwilling to go that far, right, in developing a process. I mean, this is where you can actually see. So, you know, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, the Saban Center had this private event talking about, you know, how do you challenge BDS, right? So the question is, why, why do this privately? Why not have a discussion on its merits, right? I mean, why are you having a private event to talk about challenging BDS? Why aren't you having a private event to say, here, we'll bring somebody from the movement, um, allow them to defend themselves, right, or at least to present the case for the movement and why we think that's right. And then let's, let's talk about a strategy for the way forward, right? That's what you would expect out of a think tank, particularly a prominent one like Brookings. What you'd also expect is, considering the resources that are involved, is instead of rehashing these same ideas about, you know, is it going to be 95% of the West Bank? Is it going to be 93% of the West Bank? Is it going to be, are we going to split Jerusalem? Will we never split Jerusalem? Um, when you think about, and for those who are familiar with it, when you look at kind of the, the spatial categorization of Jerusalem, how this was going to be done, even in, uh, during the Clinton uh, negotiations at Camp David and since, not workable, right? Sovereignty, ultimate sovereignty still lies with Israel, right? Uh, which, is, which is the other issue around this idea of dividing Jerusalem. And Netanyahu has said so much as much himself that even if there's an autonomous Palestinian area, ultimate sovereignty will still lie with Israel. Uh, now, so this is this is essentially a bridge too far for many think tanks right now. But this is this is where they could actually play a role is developing a workable solution on the future of Israel Palestine, right? So how would this be implemented? And there are plenty of examples that they could look at. You know, if the apartheid example is going to be thrown around, you have an example of how this worked in South Africa, and, and the aspects of the South African uh, model that did not work, all of which could be discussed and debated. Now, this we, there's a question about conflict resolution. Uh, I know when, I, when we look at the history of human rights and we look at the history of, of conflict resolution, there are several different models that, especially post-Cold War, that are adopted, um, whether it's a you know, peace and reconciliation committee, whether it is genocide tribunals. We have several different models that are adopted in terms of finding, achieving justice, right, or some variation. So it's not like this is uh, that unique of a situation, right? What may be unique about it is that there are so many untouchables that people are unwilling to discuss, right? Um, and so that gets back to Professor Human's question, that, that there are some untouchables here that people are unwilling to discuss uh, that make this somewhat, somewhat unique. We have time for one more question. Thank you for this talk. Sure. Um, so I'm looking at these issues from an ethnographic perspective. I actually study these think tanks ethnographically. Okay. So I'm actually curious um, if you can talk to the question as a historian on accountability mm. in terms of when these experts put forward ideas or make predictions, which they're increasingly being asked to do about very complex issues in the Middle East, and they get it wrong consistently. Okay. Um, what happens, what has happened historically, why do the same people keep getting called in as experts when they do get it wrong? They, they get promoted, that's what they get. Yeah. Um, they get promoted. Um, so it's, I think, I think your, your research sounds fascinating. I mean, there's some really good work um, being done that, I mean, I drew on some of it and then did some other stuff, but I, I think that's, I think it's really important. I think the reality is, you know, we talk about a, as I mentioned before, there's a culture of timidity, but there is also a culture in which, uh, you know, quite frankly, there is no negative to calling for intervention, right? Um, this rarely is criticized uh, within circles. In fact, you know, that's the one thing where you see many of these creative approaches, right? Um, so, I, unfortunately, there isn't a culture of accountability when it comes to, and, and in fact, it's not just that, you know, one of the, so I think what people don't understand is that there was, uh, and, some, and some good work has been done on this, is how think tanks, not only in replacing kind of academic experts, uh, but I touch on some of this, but one of the things that, that they are able to do is, in part, it's about access and location, right? So the fact that many are located in the D.C. area, so they have access to the major news bureaus. But they're also, very, and, and Washington Institute was very good about this, they're also very aggressive. You know, they have, uh, they will send out, uh, if there's whatever event, they already have a, you know, a pre-established uh, press release, you know, so if there's an attack or if there's an explosion or whatever, right? <coughs> Netanyahu makes a statement, or even before Netanyahu, press release goes out, and if you want, if you need comment for your, uh, for your newscast tonight, et cetera, 
um, these experts are available. So they've been very aggressive and, and very savvy, media savvy in, in terms of their approach. And of course, this access and location plays a major role. They've also built up over time very strong media connections. Um, and this happens. So for example, Martin Indyk, right? So Martin Indyk is what I mentioned. Um, uh, one of the things that he will do for Winnep very in, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, is he will become he will become a guest commentator on CNN for the Madrid Peace Conference. Uh, he will use that to transition, or even before that, he was also serving as a, a guest analysis for the coverage of the Gulf War. So the Gulf War also plays this interesting role, and I think not enough has been done on that, um, the first Gulf War, uh, in particular about because it's kind of, as many in the room may know or may remember, it becomes kind of this first, uh, you know, 24-7 uh, news, at, news uh, war, right? And the way the Vietnam War was kind of our first multimedia television war, this is your satellite television war, right? Um, or cable TV war, for lack of a better term. So uh, the need for kind of immediate expertise and immediate access is increased, even though the analysis is, 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 is weak, right? But because you're looking at a 24-7 news cycle, there's, no, there's really no reason that it has to be any deeper than just the quick soundbite. And of course, again, there's no accountability for, as you can see, in fact, the, the, the way they measure success is number of press mentions, right? Number of op-eds in newspapers. Those, those are key metrics for success. And then there's a, you know, you see this shift, as I talked about, there was this idea that, um, you know, Brookings had a major influence in 75 because some of these ideas were adopted. So you'll see that that's another aspect, particularly uh, Professor Human's question about things like tax policy or health care. These were major successes for the think tanks because some of these policy proposals were adopted by centers. So this is where Brookings is going to make, basically make a lot of its, its, uh, its impact, right? Ignoring the Middle East will be on domestic policy, um, both for Democrats and Republicans, so whether it's AEI or, or heritage. For, so in fact, you know, Heritage, uh, there was a recent article talking about how um, there's been real disputes at Heritage uh, because Heritage, how did Heritage make its name was during the Reagan administration, was effectively seen as even more than AEI is kind of providing the blueprint for the Reagan administration. And there were divisions within uh, apparently Heritage uh, and the previous leadership over how much should they work with the Trump administration or were they working with them enough. So again, you know, there are impacts beyond just the Middle East that I think are important that need to be understood. So I think, I think your work is really important. Okay, one final question before we do our book signing. Hi, Hi. Penny Mitchell with the Palestinian American Research Center. How are you? Good. Um, I wonder if we could shift the lens just a little bit if you've looked at this or maybe uh, uh, not necessarily in your book but maybe just in your thinking yeah. and look at it from the point of view of the academy yeah. and how how have the development has the development of the think tanks influenced changes from within the academy particularly um, in areas like uh, political science yeah. in these developing uh, conflict resolution things and and what have those changes been substantively for better or for worse mm -hmm. okay well so I think one of the things I talk about in the book uh, is is the following that um, from the 70s on there is this uh, a real targeting and a decrease of funding towards area studies this idea that area studies have failed right and that think tanks which are well funded and are very much willing to align themselves in terms of research uh, step into the breach. Part of this is also, one of the things I also talk about is that the government itself, so government agencies, are less willing to rely on academic research. So part of this is I talked about a culture of timidity. There's also this culture of secrecy, right? This, this fetishization, for lack of a better term, of classified and top secret information. Why should we ask an academic expert when we have access to all the latest top secret and classified information? Why am I going to read an ethnography of think tanks, right? We're just going to go to the think tanks. Uh, and one of the things I talk about is really by the 1980s, um, what you see is uh, based, on, based on certain reports that are done for the Department of Defense, both the Department of Defense and the intelligence community admit we really don't have time to read academic, manuscript, academic monographs. Like we'll go do maybe some targeted stuff or what we will do is, uh, and this is also an issue, uh, we will target specific scholars to work with. So we're going to cut contracts and, and bring them in as consultants. Uh, so in some respects, 
that much hasn't changed. And that's one of the things I talk about in, in the book is that this is what the intelligence community and the, and the foreign policy establishment were doing really back into the 40s, was very specific individuals that they would contract with. They were also interested in kind of a broader-based uh, knowledge coming out of the academy. And then it gets really refined and specific. And the think tanks really play into that. Um, in terms of uh, the relationship between think tanks and academia, uh, you know, there can be a lot of overlap. You will have this, I talked about a revolving door between think tanks and the government. You also have somewhat of a revolving door between think tanks and the academy. Think tanks are always kind of looking for uh, a university to align with. It, it gives them a, a certain level of prestige, right? Um, they're, they're often referred to as kind of universities without, uh, without students, right? Uh, so there's not a teaching requirement, right? I mean, and if you think about, you know, there's, uh, without boring the audience, there, there, are, there are elements to being a university-based scholar that are, there are requirements to it that are not required of the think tanks, right? So the emphasis for think tanks on shorter policy proposals versus a monograph, on op-eds versus peer-reviewed articles. These are very big differences on getting, on implementing actual policy, get, implementing your ideas within the administration versus how many citations do you have, right? I mean, they're very different things, right? Um, and that plays a role. Uh, now, one of the things I also talk about is, is that uh, there is this shift post 9-11 in which those academics and this new generation of academics are, don't have the reluctance of the new left to cooperate with the U.S. government. In fact, because of 9-11, they see what they're doing as kind of a patriotic duty. But we also have, and some of this, I think someone, you know, another, some graduate student somewhere eventually is going to do a book on this, is, is the impact of the Iraq war and how that further drives, you know, re reignites this division between academia and, and the government because of uh, the unwillingness to support policies that are, that are deemed uh, uh, unconscionable. Dr. Khalid, thank you so much for thank coming you. here and for speaking on Thanks this. For thank coming. you.